Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. morning. I am Deacon Nancy Stockbridge, not Mother Siobhan. Uh, For those that I have not met yet, I'm looking forward to it. Today, we have new colors, blue for Advent. Now, Advent is the beginning of the new church year. It is a time of waiting, preparing, and expecting. It is a time of deepening darkness when we contemplate shadows and silence, even as we wait for the dawning of the light from on high, Jesus Christ. We use Advent, we use the Advent wreath as a symbol of the season as we light more candles each week, culminating in God's light in the world, Jesus Christ, on Christmas. Advent also symbolizes the coming of Jesus again in clouds, as we just heard in our reading this morning from Mark. So, Happy New Year, church. In an expectant but kind of quiet way. Now, many of the readings heard in the last couple of weeks have been leading up to this point and ask us to be awake as we continue our waiting for Jesus, the Messiah. Spiritually, we do not know the exact date and time the Messiah will come, so we stay awake to be ready. Now, one of my favorite examples of being awake and ready happened in 1905 Russia, when in the midst of hardship and oppressive programs, Tevya, the main character in the musical Fiddler on the Roof, laments to the rabbi that this would be a good time for the Messiah to arrive. The wise rabbi responded, He is not here now, so we need to wait somewhere else. The waiting is for the coming of the Messiah and God's kingdom, which consists of justice, freedom from oppressive oppressive systems, freedom from fear. It includes peace, hope, love, and joy. Hope is that part that is, we understand that what we experience now will not always be. There's something else coming. So the first Sunday of Advent passages that we've heard read or sung today carry a very similar message. We have fallen short of God's expectation. God forgives us and sends Jesus to show us love and forgiveness. In Isaiah, God withholds contact from his people due to his displeasure, and Isaiah then acknowledges that we are the clay for God, the potter, and we are the work of God's hands. We are dependent on God's love and care. The psalmist acknowledges God is angered despite the prayers of the people and asks for restoration. Even using the Advent word of light in asking to be shown the light of God's countenance so they may be changed. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes that we will not lack any spiritual gift as we wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, in Mark's gospel, he reveals only the Father know when the hour of the Son's coming and exhorts us to beware, keep alert, and keep awake so that we are ready for the Son's arrival. Now, in today's culture, Asking people to stay awake is kind of a major duh, you know? 
Just look at the last three months in yours and our lives. We have started school, attended numerous sports practices, games, races, run a pumpkin patch, attended teacher conferences, prepped for setting up an apartment, stocked the food pantry, studied the Bible, mailed boxes, worshiped God, celebrated the lives of loved ones we have lost, baptized new Christians, and welcomed new members to the church. And that's just inside this space. There's a whole world out there. Talking to most of us about waiting and being awake is, with all due respect, preaching to the choir. <laughs> we live our life waiting and awake to our responsibilities. I wonder, though, if in this Advent season, we could wait and focus on God's coming in the person of Jesus Christ. As I consider what is happening outside our doors, I am concerned, and I believe God is too. There is war and conflict all over the world. After just some initial research of countries with serious conflicts, I identified 23 different international hotspots. We have personal connections to Ukraine. And we all, I would say, have a personal relationship with what's going on in the Holy Land, the place where God chose to send Jesus to live among us. On this very first Sunday of Advent, we await the coming of Jesus, who Isaiah identifies as Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This year especially, I believe we are called to await the Prince of Peace, Jesus. The situation in the Holy Land, or as it is frequently called, the Land of the Holy One, has been on many people's minds and hearts. We see stories about the violence, attacks, bloodshed, atrocity, and the young and injured children in Gaza. There are also injured children in Israel and the West Bank, ever since the horrific attack by Hamas on October 7th. We are also seeing the rise of anti-Semitism, or hate of Jewish people, and Islamophobia, the hate of Islamic people, in our own country. And we're seeing it on college campuses. At our Thanksgiving celebration on Thursday, someone shared a political cartoon with us that was pictured that there's a line right through the middle of it. On one side was the word Israel, and on the other side of the line was Gaza. The background was decimated buildings with smoke coming up out of them. And in the foreground were two families with young children on both sides. On the Israel side of the line, the family sign said, we are not Netanyahu. On the Gaza side of the line, the family sign said, we are not Hamas. These are the people that need and yearn for the Prince of Peace. These are our brothers, sisters, and siblings in the land of the Holy One. Being awake for this Advent may be to be aware of the places where the Prince of Peace is needed and where we are called to share the love and peace of God. Now, this is not a new conflict, as some of us this, just this week may have read in Joshua, those of us doing the Bible challenge, readings about the forcibly taking of land in the book of Joshua. 
People used to see and expect that conflicts, especially land conflicts, would be solved by warfare, killing, and power. Jesus came to offer an alternative with love for the oppressed, the disenfranchised, the poor. And all those Father Henry talked about last week from Matthew, the sick, the hungry, the thirsty, imprisoned, naked, or strangers. This was and still is a departure from the predominant power culture that believes that power, might, and violence is a response to disagreements, both land and personal. It does nothing but kill people and create an environment of fear and a lack of security. This week, presiding Bishop Michael Curry and the Archbishop of Jerusalem in the Middle East, Hossam Noam, had a conversation about the situation in Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. It ranged from inspiring to tragic to heartbreaking to hopeful. As you may imagine, they talked about a situation that is incredibly difficult within an atmosphere of anxiety, fear, anger, and loss. Archbishop Naum shared about the challenge and the danger of getting around the country to offer aid and support. Historically, the Christian church in the Anglican diocese in Jerusalem specifically have been a place of refuge and safety and shelter for those in conflict. Their focus has been and continues to be on reconciliation in service to all those in Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. They run schools, rehabilitation centers for children, and hospitals, including the Arab Ali Hospital, the only active hospital in northern Gaza right now. They have more institutions than parishes. When asked about what those of us here in the United States could do, the Archbishop said that our work must be to not take sides and add to the division and tension between the parties there. We should pray for peace and reconciliation, for the respect and dignity of all human beings, for a stop to the killing. Bishop Curry said to reach out to our lawmakers, local and national, for a ceasefire. The current temporary ceasefire for release of the hostages is a fragile beginning that requires our prayers. It is so fragile that before coming up here, I went to check to see what the news was because I, couldn't, I didn't know if I could say that today. So our prayers are what is going to make a difference. Yes, it is Advent, and we are awake and waiting for the Prince of Peace. May we use this time to be in prayer, support, and witness for those who need it most throughout the world. Believing is and that God is and always will be faithful. I close with a prayer from, from Archbishop Naum. O God of justice and peace, we cry out to you in the midst of the pain and trauma of violence and fear which prevails in the Holy Land. Be with those who need you in these days of suffering. We pray for people of all faiths, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and for all people of the land. While we pray to you, O Lord, for an end to violence and the establishment of peace, we also call for you to bring justice and equity to all the peoples. 
Guide us into your kingdom where all people are treated with dignity and honor as your children. For to all of us, you are all of our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.